Excellent. Welcome, everybody. A warm welcome to our participants, our panel members, and of course, everyone watching us on the live stream. Welcome to this exp international expert panel uh, on the topic of investigating the influence of Russian propaganda in Central Asia. A very relevant and timely topic and super excited to address some of the uh, granulated and nuanced topics today. What is ahead of us is, uh, you know, we have about 10 minute present per, per speaker. Uh, we will start with a welcoming speech by uh, Abahon Sultan Azarov, who is a regional director of IWPR Central Asia. This will be followed by my brief presentation on our report that came out uh, as a collaboration between CES UCAM and uh, IWPR and Kabar Asia, where we investigated the narratives and perceptions of Russian propaganda in Kyrgyzstan. We will have Kamila Smagulova presenting on um, Kazakhstan, followed by uh, Galina Petrenka, who is the director uh, of uh, media NGO in Ukraine. We are super excited to have Galina on board. And we will follow by uh, Maria, Dr. Mariela Weimars, who is an assistant professor of cybersecurity and politics uh, at the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. So this is the menu for today. I'll give the floor to Abahon Sultan Azarov, Regional Director, IWPR, Central Asia. Abahon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Rashid Gabdulhakov, dear guests, partners and donors, friends. Uh, I'm really, truly honored to welcome all of you to this important expert panel discussion titled Shaping Perceptions, Investigating the Influence of Russian Propaganda in Central Asia. It's a privilege to have you all here today as we gather to delve into a topic of high significance in our interconnected world. Let me welcome all of you on behalf of the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, IWPR, and its regional uh, Central Asia regional analytical platform, Kabar Asia. IWPR Central Asia has been a trusted partner for policymakers, academics, and civil society actors in the region providing accurate, balanced, and unbiased reporting and analytics on Central Asia's political, economic, and social developments. Today's discussion is the result of extensive research conducted by IWPR in collaboration with our partners, EUCAM program. Our groundbreaking work, Narratives and Perceptions of Russian Propaganda in Kyrgyzstan, sheds light on a matter matter that concerns us all. Today, we are here to engage in a constructive dialogue, share insight, and explore potential solutions. I'm delighted and honored to see such prominent experts here today with us. Last but not uh, least, this online expert meeting is part of a series under the Amplify, Verify, Engage, Information for Democratization and Good Governance in Eurasia project generously funded by the Royal Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. We sincerely thank the Norwegian government for being a long, our long term donor and partner. It's honor to see here today ambassadors uh, John Kvistad and Ole Brno. I'm confident that the discussions today will be insightful, thought prov uh, provo uh, pro provoking and productive. I urge you all to engage in lively debate to challenge each other's idea and work together to find solution. Thank you very much for attention. And on this note, I'm passing the floor to our amazing speaker, moderator and long-term partner, Dr. Rashid Gabdulhakov, assistant professor at Center for Mid and Journal Studies, University of uh, Groningen and UCAM Research Associated. Dr. Rashid, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for your warm words of welcome and uh, for your uh, uh, general feedback. Uh, for the next 10 minutes, I will briefly outline some of the work that has been done in collaboration between IWPR and CES UCAM, who I uh, re co-represent today. Uh, the idea was to analyze the narratives, the message that is available to audiences in Kyrgyzstan coming from Russia, of course, but also simultaneously to try and understand the on-the-ground perceptions of this message. So lots of work was done in a very short amount of time, and I want to thank the entire research team for the incredible work that they have done. 
Uh, you know, there is always the, the, the hours and hours of uh, human dedication to, to all of these reports. What we did was we identified some of the main channels, uh, outlets available for audiences in Kyrgyzstan, and we diversified them in terms of, okay, we looked at television channels, newspapers, uh, news agencies that are available entirely online, like Sputnik, for instance. And we started gathering the data uh, in, in the form of kilometers and kilometers of screenshots. Then we used Atlas TI software, which is designed for qualitative research to analyze what is encoded in this message. At the same time, focus groups were carried out in three locations across Kyrgyzstan, in the south, in Osh, in the center of the country, in Narin, and up north in Bishkek. Uh, participants were recruited from diverse backgrounds. Uh, we allowed them to make a choice for what language they want the focus groups to take place in. Uh, in the South, it was a mix of Russian and Kyrgyz. In Narin, people opted for Kyrgyz entirely, and in Bishkek, people opted for Russian. Uh, what else? Did, so uh, having done all of this analysis, both the message sent and message received, the following came clear from the message sent. Uh, Russia has a clear line of, of a clear message for Central Asia more broadly and for Kyrgyzstan specifically that any attempt to break ties with Russia, any attempt to de Sovietize, de uh, uh, colonize, and uh, you know, to separate from Russia, to take any steps towards independence uh, uh, in terms of uh, language policies, are taken very uh, harshly and Russia immediately starts threatening, you know, almost openly threatening that you will be next Ukraine. Look at what's going on, right? If you try to make friends with the West, uh, then this is the fate that it that is awaiting you. That comes hand in hand with the demonization of the collective collective West. The rhetoric is very uh, Soviet era like. Yeah, it is very much the Cold War era propaganda strategy where the West is uh, you know, lumped together into this evil force that is out there to destroy moral values. The idea of a moral nature of the West, that they, they're here to spread uh, their own amoral agenda is being delivered to audiences in Kyrgyzstan. And as we were unpacking these narratives that are encoded in Russian media, at the same time, you know, looking at what people are answering in focus groups, many of these encoded messages were echoing. Yeah, people are repeating this mantra-like narrative that the West is evil and that the West is, is there to demoralize us. Another message that is sent is that Russia is the security guarantor. Without Russia, we will not stand. Yeah, and just this morning I read the news that uh, Russia's uh, chief security officer uh, is now making statements that Central Asia is under an extreme threat of terrorism and that Russia is out there to protect us. So this line was encoded in, in hundreds of news items that without Russia, Central Asia's security is unstable and threatened by a number of actors, state and non-state, and that Russia is a, the only uh, actor that can guarantee us security. Uh, Russia, in this sense, is uh, portrayed as a giver and forgiver. Russia gives, uh, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, some hard harsh, harsh, harsh security, but also some uh, uh, soft things such as the language, books, delivers teachers, can give some grants, and eventually can even forgive you so you don't have to pay back. Russia can forgive your migrants, yeah? So if they violate the immigration laws and are sent back, eventually they can be forgiven and returned. And... <laughs> If we look a bit deeper into this encoded message, the combination of words that are used are important. If we look at the strategy, so the, you know they, they're really using this term CIS quite often, yeah, the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States. There is a summit happening as we speak in Bishkek. Uh, so this zombie-like political entity is emphasized as still highly relevant, highly important, and that Russia is playing a central role here. How are people perceiving these narratives on the ground and media in general? Yeah, we had to be also quite quite careful in, in the way we frame our questions, in the way we uh, allow people to speak for themselves without us planting any seeds in their heads. So we just tried to carry out this open and warm conversation on media. Yeah. So one of the first questions to warm up the group 
uh, were how do you find your information? What are the sources of information for you? And here some already some important revelations came clear. While, of course, increasingly social media play an important role, television still remains relevant. For many, it plays on the background, kind of still this entertainment box. And, but when they look, when they watch these entertainment products, most of them come from Russia because domestic um, TV channels cannot compete quality-wise with entertainment products. So that is something to keep in mind as well, because in, in Russia, if you look at the way uh, the broadcast system works, all entertainment programs are either interrupted or immediately followed by a news block. So you also get uh, politically informed uh, while being entertained, this kind of infotainment yeah, approach. Of course, with the growth of social media and with the you know low prices on the internet and people have all devices all across the country, people get uh, live in the state of passive news consumption, news find me kind of a world. Yeah? You open the, your gadget, your device, maybe just to get in touch with friends, and suddenly all these news items start jumping at you from your screen. And that was also a major source. And people spoke really positively about the role of algorithms here. That, you know, how convenient is it? You go on Instagram and all the news you are interested in is just given to you. Or you go on TikTok and all the news you, you wanted to see is just uh, jumping at you from the screen. <laughs> well, it's certainly convenient here. I want to stress some of the potential potential dangers uh, you know, there is this uh, echo chamber effect where your predisp predispositions, where your opinions are never challenged because, you know, maybe in your family, you are discussing politics in a particular way. You go to work and it's the same, you know, same echo like narrative and you go online. And because the algorithms choose to show you the information that is most relevant to you, then you are never challenged online either. And then audiences in Kyrgyzstan are deprived of the of hearing of the opportunity to hear the voice of uh, Ukraine. To hear the voice of on the ground uh, on how people experience war, Russia's invasion in Ukraine. And at the end of the day, they're only left with a one-sided story. If you look at some quotes, I, I have this report open in front of me. Uh, by the way, our report is available in English, Russian, and Kyrgyz. And we also have a shorter policy brief, which is also available in three languages. We also have a variety of other products uh, based on this report, including a podcast. So please you know, reach out and uh, I hope uh, you will get a chance to read through or listen uh, to some of the conversations that we have had already about it. If we look at some of the quotes from people in Bishkek, Osh and Narin, you know, some of the vivid ones, I will just read them out. How can I explain it to you? I don't know. Uh, I just trust the Russian media. I don't understand why. If I watch Ukrainian news, I still believe that Ru the Russian ones. You know, someone says that uh, it's fake news, but I still trust the Russian media more. This quote was so vivid that we titled our report, I still trust the Russian media more. Uh, in my opinion, the Russian media is good media. The information there is reliable. You know, uh, people really view that the, the fact that Russia has journalists all over the world makes that information reliable. Some other quotes I will paraphrase for the sake of time. <laughs> so when people mention that they are unsure of the quality of information, they go on and turn on TV, turn on their TV as a kind of a fact-checking tool to see if what they have read online is true or not. And you know that, of course, creates quite a bit of problems. If we want to draw some conclusions, well, Russian media is dominant in Kyrgyzstan. Yeah, if we look at both uh, traditional and social media, which we cannot really clearly differentiate anymore because of the convergence effect. Yeah, all the traditional media are now present across a plethora of social media platforms. Uh, Russian media is there in huge volumes, posting every minute, essentially. Yeah, so present across a plethora of platforms and creating a ton of content and therefore dwarfing any other actor, be it local media or, of course, international media with local branches. That is now going hand in hand with a state crackdown on uh, 
independent journalism in Kyrgyzstan. Unfortunately, what we see is the copy pasting of some of the legislation from Russia that is designed to uh, suppress critical voices or uh, objective reporting. Uh, what, what they are also winning on is the idea that they're delivering narratives, messages in the local languages. If you go on Sputnik KG, their homepage is now entirely in Kyrgyz, which is something that independent media has been struggling to achieve. And Russia is doing that successfully, running special uh, reports on their special military operation. And so what are some of the potential dangers aside for, the, for uh, you know, not being exposed to objective and truthful information about uh, themselves, <laughs> I'm talking about audiences in Kyrgyzstan, about international relations or war in Ukraine, is that, you know, among many aspects, I'll just point one for the sake of time, is the recruitment strategy. Russia is presenting war as an opportunity, recruiting Central Asians into fighting in this war using both carrot and the stick strategy. The carrot being a promise of a Russian passport and you know, uh, large sums of money per month as a payout and the stick being a threat to being deported back to the home country. All in all, <laughs> uh, to draw some conclusions and to tie this to a algorithmic discussion, all of the above having been said, what we also were alarmed with at the end of the day is the role of algorithms here. Having identified the Russian propaganda, having understood that it's, it's basically winning on the ground in Central Asia, in Kyrgyzstan specifically, uh, what, how can algorithms be used, if at all, to counter these strategies? Can they be relied upon to uh, deliver alternative messages for audiences? This is something that we wanted to address. And that's why this panel is kind of a, just a start off to this conversation. Of course, I invite all of our uh, viewers and uh, participants more broadly, if you have any thoughts, ideas, please share, state your questions. This is just an initiation of a conversation and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get in touch and form some uh, you know, workshops and groups that can tackle this issue together. I will stop here and I will pass the floor to my dear friend and colleague, Kamila Smagulova, who will talk about the changing narratives and polarization in Kazakhstan. And she will address the grassroots, grassroots of propaganda. Kamila, if you are ready. Uh, thanks a lot, Rashid. I'm very glad to be here today, and I'm very glad because both the WPR and UCOM are two organizations that I've been cooperated for so long, and uh, the organizations that are, uh, like, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very glad to see so many familiar faces uh, and so many familiar names. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I will go through, actually, Right before this event, I remembered about one research that I will maybe briefly mention because for Kazakhstan, there is not yet research exactly like, for example, for the case of Kyrgyzstan, which would directly address what kind of Russian propaganda uh, narratives are present and how people react on this. That is why mostly what I will be focusing on are the cases where on grassroots people either accept or reject uh, the propaganda cases in Kazakhstan. There's uh, like so far only maybe one research that quickly touch up on that is European Neighborhood and Internews Project on Media and Consumption in Central Asia that you can refer to exactly to be the part of this. But at the same time, there are no sur surveys and researchers on that yet. So uh, what is very important that over time, uh, the narratives uh, of decolonial, for example, thought in Kazakhstan have been increasing. At the same time, there is a pro-Russian part of our societies all over Central Asia that exist. And we cannot say that our whole societies are so decolonial and so like trying to get back to their subjectivity. So I will maybe go through some cases and the user's behavior, what is going on, not only online, not only within digital activism. Uh, usually when we talk about media consumption and for example if we refer to european neighborhood research it says that in kazakhstan most people still consume uh, their news in russian language and the reason for that predominantly is systemic uh like disbalance imbalance of kazakh and russian languages in kazakhstan uh, where for example like the simple case the simple explanation knowing only russian 
gives you opportunities to live and earn. Knowing only Kazakh in Kazakhstan gives you much less opportunities. So there is certainly an equality of that. And this is also related to how people consume news. At the same time, according to this research, politics is seen as one of those topics that are discussed in Kazakhstan and alongside in Kyrgyzstan in comparison to other Central Asian states like Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, for example. And for sure, polarization has been one of those uh, topics that have been on spot all over this time. And Rashid also mentioned about desovitizing and decolonizing because there are people who would advocate for that. At the same time, there are people who would advocate for re-Sovietizing. There are people who would be uh, protesting and organizing par uh, parades on 9th of May, which are officially, I think, no longer... Uh, this is no longer the case that you would have parade in Astana or any other capital across Central Asia. At the same time, there are people who support that, and there are people who wear what in Russian we would say Georgi Skalienta, so orange slash black uh, bands on their clothes and everything, and who would say that USSR was friendships of people. But what we are trying to also observe is how uh, movements, decolonial movements, saying that friendships of people was not the way it is, it's also important. At the same time, people who are more pro-Russian would say that it was a friendship of people and speaking only Russian is still fine. And for example, very recent news in Kazakhstan that, can you imagine 2023, the last Kazakh school in the small town Ridder in East Kazakhstan, my own home region has been closed, I think a few weeks ago. So in a small town in Kazakhstan in 2023, there are no Kazakh speaking schools. And uh, since public here, there is more pro, uh, not pro, sorry, more Russian speaking, usually Russian online media, not only Sputnik, but different, different medias would use people's awakening in attempts to reclaim their own national and state language, official language, Kazakh, they portrayed as nationalism. They portrayed as Kazakh nationalists are trying to reclaim. The recent events, for example, when uh, public has been canceling different, what they call it, Z artists, like those who uh, support special military operation, as they call it in Russia. Uh, unfortunately, these people have their concerts in Kazakhstan and public try to cancel them. They try to open different online campaigns. They sign petitions against that. At the same time, Russian media uses it and says that there are Kazakh nationalists who are provoking and who are uh, going on anti-Russian protests. At the same time, um, what is what might be also wrong, it's not about Russia, it's about all those countries trying to reclaim what was theirs and try to promote their state language. And it's not about being anti or pro or something. Uh, yeah, so, but still those artists still come Current, I don't want to mention their names because I don't want to give them publicity and validate them. But I think if you follow news, you understand what kind of Russian artists I'm talking about, like performance and everything. And uh, also people now in, I think, attempt to deter and to repel what has been in the propaganda. For example, they try to advocate for Russian media who still use Alma Ata instead of Almaty. Uh, who still use Kyrgyzian instead of Kyrgyzstan, for example, recent meeting of uh, President Japarov and Vladimir Putin, uh, Putin systemically kept saying Kyrgyzia, Kyrgyzia, even though he could pronounce the Japarov's name and last name correctly, he would still use the word Kyrgyzia constantly over and over again. And this is something that Russian speaking media is doing. And this is something that many activists try to uh, go against. And going back to, for example, some other news which have happened a little bit earlier uh, in July uh, in Almaty, there was uh, Alexander Nevsky's monument opened uh, and with involvement in Russian Orthodox Church. And once again, this was also something that have provoked different kind of opinions. There were people who would be protesting and saying that this is very unreasonable and this should, this should not happen. At the same time, people who try to remain neutral and try to say that religion is out of politics, try to make it not an issue. At the same time, this is like everybody knows the involvement of Russian Orthodox Church and its role and influence on the countries all over the post-Soviet uh, 
Well, Soviet is also something to be questioned now, but all over former Soviet Union countries, not only Kazakhstan, but everybody knows Georgia and everything. And this is also the clash where polarization occurs when there are people would be saying that this is something that should not be happening in 2023 in an independent country. At the same time, people who would advocate and saying religion is out of politics. And one of the, I think, common ways of how public tries to um, resist to that is petitions. For example, recently, this is a little bit more recent news that I think some of you have followed that in October, actually, very soon, in a few days, there would be a school on Central Asia happening, I think, by Garchikov's fund. And uh, activists from Kazakhstan have started online petition on that, saying that this should not happen because this is not one of those schools or one of those Central Asian events, but direct involvement of um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia. Uh, and one of another uh, ways where media is also being involved and where uh, people from pop culture are being involved, uh, I think some of you may have been following what is going on, the debates about potential uh, nuclear power plants in Kazakhstan. There are many debates on that as well. And the involvement of Rosatom in this is also cause, causing different uh, clashes. And of course, narratives like long-term friendship with Russia is playing a part in that. And Kazakh um, DJ, I think he's a DJ performer, Iman Bek recently, not actually recently, it was in July 2023, but for some reason, uh, Kazakh media did not make it a big news. Uh, but this uh, above mentioned Sputnik, they wrote that uh, the singer, the singer, have recorded legendary sounds of Leningrad nuclear power plant, Leningradskaya AS. Uh, I don't know. This news have not been very discussed, but this is also the case. This is also what is happening uh, in current um, in current society. And also, of course, there are different unions: unions of conscious people, unions of parents, who uh, also use the methods of promotion of LGBT, and for example, when feminists are, uh, act, feminist activists are trying to promote gender equality, they would say that this is propaganda of LGBT, LGBTQ, and also using very much of methods uh, that Russia has been doing. And the same that there has been registry published in Kazakhstan recently with a list of people and organizations who receive uh, funding from international organizations. And this is also something that people may assume to be this... Uh, prerequisites of future foreign agents law, but still there is no such a law yet and we cannot uh, use that uh, for this. But what is important that there are no organizations and people who receive funding from Russia, from Russian organizations, which is also the point to be discussed, I think. Um, yeah, and these are, I think, the main current events that I would mention and list here that what has been happening. But once again, there is no big survey and research yet, and I hope it might happen and it might be an idea for researchers in Kazakhstan to start on what is the effect of Russian propaganda, because there have been surveys uh, with my colleagues from Paper Lab and Dimascope as well. They uh, made surveys on how people in Kazakhstan perceive war in Ukraine, for example. But um, we do need similar researches for Kazakhstan on Russian propaganda resistance or support of like this propaganda movements. So, so far, that's it. I'll be ready for the questions. I hope I fit in time. Perfect timing, Camila. Thank you so much. And of course, Camila is representing the Paper Lab uh, Policy Research Center. Please follow them across uh, well, on their website and across social media uh, platforms. They're doing some incredible research. And just a, a quick note on this. Uh, th this research should be uh, ongoing, right? Because as narratives are changing, as perceptions are changing, we need this systematic approach. It's not enough to just do something uh, once and it needs to be granulated. So I'm really happy that our the way we even conduct our conversations has changed. In the past, it was all like, oh, it's in Central Asia, but we cannot make these kinds of uh, broad conclusions as each state will have uh, its own story and its own approach and i'm really glad that we are now doing things in more in a more granulated manner camila thank you for these insights i already see some questions in the chat which makes me happy and we will address them at the end of our discussion now i would like to pass the floor uh to galina petrenka who is a director of detector media ngo uh galina is based in ukraine and we are so honored to have her galina for the next 10 minutes the floor is yours 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, actually, uh, yes, I'm based in Ukraine, in Kyiv, and I'm now in Kyiv. And uh, probably it could be a question why I decided to propose a topic to talk about uh, Russian disinformation interference uh, to upcoming elections in the EU uh, and in uh, US, because um, uh, it uh, would be more natural that uh, I would talk about Ukraine, but the truth is uh, that uh, when I'm talking about um, elections in the EU, I'm talking about Ukraine indeed because uh, Ukraine now is uh, crucially dependent uh, on uh, support of uh, Western partners uh, in terms of military support and financial support. And, and um, it's really crucial to have um, that we have uh, this political support, support um, among citizens in those countries and uh, support uh, among politicians in those uh, Western democracies. And uh, what we see from, uh, so um, in uh, the end of September, uh, elections uh, happened in Slovakia. And unfortunately, it was a sad news uh, that uh, during that parliamentary elections, um, the pro-Russian party won uh, these elections. It's really sad news for us because yes, Slovakia is a small country, but it's now a neighbor. It's a vote in the EU, it's a vote in NATO. And uh, moreover, it's uh, some trend and tendency if we uh, are not able to analyze it and uh, somehow react uh, all together. Uh, what happened in Slovakia? Um, main, so Russia, of course, uh, disseminated uh, its uh, disinformation through social networks uh, in particular. And the uh, main Russian narratives that were observed in Slovakia during uh, pre-election time uh, were as follows. Uh, the West provoked Russia and started the war. Uh, Russia will use nuclear weapons if Ukraine takes back control of occupied territories. Uh, Western sanctions on Russia have no impact. Uh, Slovakia should end all support for Ukraine. Uh, NATO is useless uh, or dangerous, uh, and uh, the EU blindly follows Washington's agenda. Uh, what's also interesting, uh, there were some fakes about President Volodymyr Zelensky that uh, he is um, uh, drug addicted and that he has some um, property in Egypt uh, for some reason, I don't know why uh, in Egypt. Uh, what was also new one, uh, if you're talking about those uh, Slovak elections, um, we uh, noticed uh, the usage of artificial intelligence uh, in creating uh, some fakes, um, voice over video or uh, like deep fakes video. Uh, for example, uh, it was uh, with usage of artificial intelligence, it was created a video, a conversation between uh, the um, leader of uh, pro-European uh, party and some TV host uh, in Slovakia. And they were discussing, um, it, it was, uh, I would repeat again, false discussion. They were discussing the um, uh, how to buy votes from uh, Roma minority in uh, Slovakia. Uh, also, we uh, we see that um, this weekend in Poland uh, will be uh, elections to, to their parliament, and Poland was a very close partner of Ukraine since the invasion, and now we um, our relations spoiled uh, because of a grade or because of uh, uh, political agenda. Politicians, they al always uh, use uh, any quarrels uh, that uh, might exist in some uh, societies. Uh, and for example, Russian disinformation now uses uh, actively all fears of uh, Polish uh, uh, society uh, and uh, says that, for example, if you allow uh, Ukrainian uh, producers of goods, if any goods, uh, to uh, be uh, freely presented in your market, so they will just uh, ruin your economy, uh, take your uh, jobs uh, for them, uh, and so on. And um, also, Russia always say for, says, for example, that 
Poland uh, wants to uh, seize a part of Ukrainian territory uh, for it. So uh, Russia is doing very actively. Uh, I was thinking what uh, can be done. Um, actually, uh, we, we all understand that it's needed to be united uh, for all of us uh, in uh, pushing uh, big tech companies, social media platforms, uh, to uh, adjust their policies, to react on uh, all these problems uh, with uh, uh, disinformation, with foreign interference in democratic processes. Uh, we always need to be pushy uh, to them. Um, I'm thinking about this artificial intelligence development. Uh, of course, uh, uh, it's needed to develop some rules and policies, how we use uh, artificial intelligence in media work, in academia uh, work, in, uh, everywhere. Uh, but what we also see that uh, like uh, those guys who are on the good side uh, of the process, they are created, creating policies and those guys who are on the bad side of the process, they just use already artificial intelligence. But still uh, those, guys, those people who uh, are working professionally with uh, artificial intelligence, they, they are not so negative. Uh, they are positive quite. They say that, yes, but we can also use this technology for example, when we are monitoring uh, information space and we really can react more uh, quickly, we can react fast uh, on uh, any alerts uh, that we can see uh, from um, hostile uh, information uh, actors and stakeholders. Another question that we uh, already, uh, what we already started to do in Ukraine, my organization, we started to, uh, to do uh, more like the next step of analysis of monitoring of uh, this information, uh, we not only uh, collect uh, and analyze uh, Russian narratives, but we also conduct sentiment analysis. Uh, that means how uh, audience, uh, uh, what they are thinking, what they are feeling about uh, these info messages. Uh, what is their attitude? Uh, maybe not, not even uh, like, vocal attitude when when you ask for example in opinion polls what they are thinking but uh, what is their uh, more um, hidden uh, attitude to it uh, and uh, my uh, sorry my um one more suggestion <laughs> Um, yes, we have, we have one more initiative uh, also in Ukraine, my organization. Uh, when we realized uh, that um, you know all this uh, official, uh, all these official official channels uh, and tools of communication with representatives of social media, uh, when they are are effective to some uh, extent, but not, and it's not an ideal situation. Uh, here in Ukraine started uh, to appear some grassroots initiatives of volunteers who use uh, like guerrilla approach, who uh, interact with uh, representatives of social media on one-to-one -one level, non-officially, uh, who have some friends there or who have some like, you know, whistleblowers from big tech companies and who tries to, uh, to uh, help, for example, uh, to, uh, to, I don't know if, if some uh, account uh, on Facebook was banned uh, for some content, uh, they try uh, using this unofficial method to uh, help uh, this account to be visible again. Uh, and uh, this, this is how it looks like from uh, our perspective. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Halina, thank you so much. Again, we are so privileged to have you and to have your voice here. Thank you for that. And uh, of course, in, in the kind of conditions that you are working, it's, it's just incredible. I'm pretty sure there will be lots of uh, questions or uh, fruitful discussions. Really appreciate your inputs. Now I will give the floor to Dr. Marielle Weimers. Uh, she's an assistant professor at Maastricht University, uh, focusing on cybersecurity and, and politics. And Marielle will talk about the invisible censorship, the restriction of media freedom on Yandex platform in Russia. Marielle, the floor is yours. Uh, of course, first of all, thank you very much for the organizers for inviting me. I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. 
and uh, hopefully to indeed contribute something from the perspective of what has been happening in Russia over the past 10 years or so. So I'll be drawing on a series of research papers that I've done together with various collaborators, where we've been studying how media censorship in Russia works, and especially, of course, how the room for independent reporting and its dissemination online, how that has been restricted over the past years. And one thing in particular that we've looked at is the role of platforms. So in the Russian case, this is mostly Yandex. Uh, so given its very dominant position in the market already for various years. So we've looked at, uh, for example, the Yandex search engine, also comparing it to Google search engine, but also to news aggregators and also to Yandex Zen. So that's a, a more personalized kind of platform. Uh, so there've been many changes in the Russian market since then. So even these two products no longer belong to Yandex. They've been taken over by VK, uh, but this is what we have been studying. Uh, so rather than uh, really presenting those studies to you, because um, they are open access, so you can read them uh, freely online, I wanted to draw some, uh, some lessons from them. So what can we learn from how Russia has approached this challenge of trying to control what information is available online? So trying to, on the one hand, uh, create suitable conditions for spreading state propaganda, uh, while at the same time limiting the reach of independent reporting. Because in a general sense, you can say that there are two basic approaches. Uh, one is the more old school one that is targeting the actual production. Uh, so these are, for example, uh, intimidation, violence against journalists, uh, like everything that really targets media outlets themselves. And the second tactic uh, that I've been focusing on mostly is targeting the news dissemination. So knowing that the room for independent journalism within traditional media forms have been, has been restricted for many years. So for example, television, this has been under state control for a very long time. This means that independent reporting then was only possible online. Uh, so it's a very uh, vulnerable situation in a sense. So on the one hand, the internet gives great opportunity, uh, but it also means that uh, this opportunity might actually be restricted. So how has Russia done this and what is the role of those platforms? Um, so one important takeaway, I would say, um, is that indeed these platforms uh, are becoming much more central in the way that Russians have consumed news, of course, especially younger generations, but especially older as well. We see those shifts across the board. Uh, but one thing that is often uh, missed is that a lot of this is also mobile internet. So this means that it's even more narrow since the way that we consume information online, you use your browser. Uh, theoretically, you could go anywhere. On your phone, it tends to be non really browsers. So it's more apps, social media. So this means that these platforms that you use and how they recommend information, uh, what kind of things you might be able to follow, what is more visible, what is less visible, this then becomes very influential in determining the reach. Uh, and oftentimes the reach also means income for these media. So it's directly related to the actual income and therefore also economic viability of independent media. Uh, so in Russia, we've seen that this has been used quite effectively. Uh, so this has taken actually quite some years. So for example, uh, gaining control over what news gets recommended in Yandex Novosti, as it was. Uh, this took many years, uh, but in the end, Russia was successful. So it was successful in limiting what kind of news sources could be recommended. So pushing out the independent ones. And I call this invisible censorship since for the user, nothing really changed. They still see the top 10. They still think that this is the news. And this is then integrated with the search engine, meaning that even if they use the browser, this is their landing site. Uh, so these kinds of uh, structural ways in which information is more or less accessible, they can be very influential and more importantly, not so easy to spot by a general user. So of course, I'm more most interested in how masses find the information. So niche audiences, they will find their preferred sources. Uh, but it's really about uh, things that are accessible for the broader audiences. Uh, one thing we also noticed uh, when working with journalists or doing a lot of interviews was that the way that these platforms work and the way that they think that they work, this also influenced the way that journalists actually do their work. So what kind of stories they write, how they have to formulate headlines, for example. Uh, so they try to anticipate uh, what can help them to reach their audience. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't always work. Uh, so one thing we noticed was that journalists were able to uh, quite well understand Yandex Novosti, but then when everything shifted to Yandex Zen, 
this was more personalized, much more competition between news and entertainment content, that then for some reason they could no longer understand it. The only thing they did notice was that they were being punished for things that were called negative news, which of course, according to journalists, is ridiculous since any form of news usually tends to be quite negative. Um, so they see that the platform was actually punishing actual reporting, so pushing down news. And this, of course, is very detrimental since news organizations, they adjust their, their way that they work to be active on those platforms. Uh, they might even hire special staff to do so. But in the end, uh, when the platform changes the way that they work, it, this might all be in vain. So you see a, a loss of resources. I think that that is something that is perhaps quite uh, important to keep in mind. So indeed, the interaction between platforms and news work and how this also affects uh, the limited resources that independent media outlets have. Um, another thing that I want to, to draw from this is that indeed, so these platforms are very influential. Uh, the algorithmic systems are very influential in shaping information and how it spreads. But at the same time, it all really hinges on the production side. And I think we've seen this in the previous con contributions as well. So if there is a lot of material available from Russian state media that are able to outproduce local production, uh, then this, of course, is a problem. If uh, access to independent media or if the production is so low, this also means that it will not really reach its audience through these platforms. There are very basic rules. Uh, so, for example, why do news agencies perform well? Because they publish very often. Uh, so there is something in a way that these systems work that, for example, frequency helps you to get recommendations more. Uh, so these are very structural factors. Um, this would be the second thing for me to take away that indeed, yes, we should be looking at the systems, but at the same time, if there is no independent reporting to go into the system, then it can also not come out on the other end. Uh, so we need to really focus on the production side and making sure that indeed the type of independent reporting that we think is useful, that this gets supported. At the same time, final point um, is about entertainment, which I think also already came up a bit. Uh, we've seen this being used in the past in Russia as well. So using entertainment as a demobilizational tool, depoliticization in platforms, uh, which of course is very successful. Uh, so we see that sometimes audiences turn away from news and entertainment might be a way to actually get them in and to then intersect other kinds of coverage. Um, so what the challenge then is for independent reporting is to make it attractive. So to have something that is sufficiently tailored to the local audiences that feels as if it is their news, uh, while at the same time still being independent and still serving that function. This, of course, is very challenging. And I think that uh, this uh, here we have Russia as a very able competitor uh, that is very sophisticated in actually doing so. Uh, so I would say that those are, uh, for now, my initial thoughts so based on what we can learn from what has happened in Russia over the past 10 years. Uh, but I'm happy to also pick up on some more cases in the discussion later on. Thank you. Maria, thank you so much. Excellent timing and, of course, very deep uh, insights that we hope to uh, build upon now. I thank all the speakers for your contributions. A reminder to our viewers and participants that they can state their uh, questions in the chat function here. We already have some reactions, some questions, and even an ex extended text that has been shared by the audience. Uh, so maybe I'll just start with the question uh, by Stepan Ganchirov. Uh, what factors besides language influence the level of exposure to Russian state media? Uh, I, will, I, will, I will comment real quick, and then if anyone wants to build up, please do, uh, because I, 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 we've covered that in our report. Well, Russian media didn't arrive in Central Asia. It simply never left, right? So it was there since uh, for, for decades. Uh, of course, for many, it's a sentimental value. It's the quality that we already ad addressed. It's some of those programs that don't have an alternative. So in the evening, you come home, you turn on the TV, maybe you are disenchanted with your local media, nothing interesting. You know, uh, Western media is too alien for you and that just doesn't click. And you turn on that good old sentimental uh, constanta of yours where the same actress, same music, you know, same... Uh, 
cultural products are there for you. And that leads me to the next point of just the broader influence and success of Russian propaganda. It's not just in the news, it's in the cultural code. Yeah, it's in our celebrations, in the types of movies that we watch, the so-called, you know, the Zalataya Kalekce film, yeah, the, the golden collection of Soviet movies that we all are taught to admire, the literature that we are brought up with, the statues that fill our uh, cities. The names of the streets and uh, that we don't dare uh, renaming because immediately there will be a finger waved at us so it's deeply engraved uh, in, weaved into our cultural code and it just they, it, that is one of all one other major success point of course besides the language and now with the prevalence of the internet and you know there are measures taken in kyrgyzstan specifically to connect even the most remote mountain villages to the global web which is fantastic in many ways but we also need to take a couple of steps back and to try to question what kind of content are people exposed to as a result who produces the online content and and what is the price tag that comes along with it so more entertainment more in the local languages produced by local actors and that is not not filled with propaganda would be one of the solutions. If anyone has uh, something to contribute to this particular question. I would maybe catch up, Rashid, on the point of cultural code Please. and the long-term ties since Soviet Union. And I think the fact that the existence of Soyuz Kinematographist, of all these uh, unions, right, this is as a legacy of Soviet Union, this is very important. And also in terms of influence and entertainment in particular, for example, there are many uh, actors and actresses and singers any many performance who used to who used to be soviet performance back then and who are ended up living in independent kazakhstan kyrgyzstan and for example who still have their concerts in russia or who still appear on russian media because this is also the part of their entire careers most of them have received this education so this is basically what has been happening in terms of soviet what they used to call it cultural revolution uh, which was not revolution indeed, right? Which was not about building equalities, but more about orientalizing and exoticizing things. And also, of course, about the availability. Uh, the question of uh, like the demand and some requests for banning or at least reducing the amount of Russian TV channels, for example, on TV, have not appeared uh, since like after full-scale invasion, right? This discussions were longer ago, but they were not very visible. It's just their visibility have increased after war has started. And of course, uh, like Russian media, Russian TV channels have gained support and they still have support. And once again, um, for years, many Kazakh performance have, uh, like they needed Russia to be recognized. We still have our performance in different kind of fields who had to, like the media, local medias were not very supportive of them. They actually gave them away. And it's also about the inequality as well, inequality to opportunities that for many, it's not even about media now, it's about economic situation that for many, for example, cities, towns in Kazakhstan in Northern parts on Western parts, it was cheaper to travel and get education in Russia get education in Novosibirsk, Tomsk, Barnaul, but not in Almaty and Astana, for example. And this is how all these ties have been created all those years. And it's maybe not about even language, it's about inequality that have happened all over the years, I would say. Thank you, Camilla. Are we ready to move on to the next question or anything else here? Then I will read the question by... Uh... Irke Bulan, who is asking, uh, based on your research, how has the Russian propaganda changed since, the, since Russia invaded Ukraine? Any examples, sources, data, literature? Would someone, I think it's for everyone, so whoever would like to tackle. Well, I can, I can maybe have a first go. Um, it is a very big question, because uh, I think that, um, well, first of all, of course, uh, Russian media, and especially also what we would just basically call Russian propaganda, has tremendously changed. I think one of the key changes is that uh, before there was still some semblance that not everything had to be extreme. So there was a lot of extreme statements, a lot of, especially regarding Ukraine, uh, the most of the narratives that we see now, we, they, are, they are very familiar. We know them since at least 2014. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that right now, the extent and extremity that we see in this propaganda, it has become even worse than it was before. 
Uh, so there's no more illusions, no more euphemisms. Everything is stated very, very outright. Um, and the previous strategies that we also saw in terms of just providing as many conspirological explanations as possible to just confuse and demobilize the population, uh, that this strategy is still, still very dominant. So this is still being used all the time. Uh, but in terms of resources, uh, I would perhaps suggest uh, the uh, Russian Media Observation and Reporting Project that's run by Paul Good at Carleton University. Uh, what they do is they um, they use uh, or they they analyze the actual coverage uh, of Russian news, so also including local local news, uh, and they um, they analyze the differences in themes. So, for example, the frequency of reporting uh, or like, commenting on the war. Uh, compared to frequency of weather, so it's seeing whether there are very intense spirits or not, and especially also what kinds of narratives and justifications who are defined as being enemies and so on. Uh, so I think that that is a very important project in terms of gaining a sense of these overall trends uh, and also trying to, to understand them better. Uh, so that's one large scale project that I think is doing uh, doing a lot of good work. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, would anyone else like to comment? Maybe I will uh, quickly uh, address this one as well. It depends on the sector, I would say. So obviously we see an increased volume in demonizing Ukraine, demonizing the people of Ukraine, demonizing uh, the establishment in Ukraine. Uh, Helena mentioned already uh, this dehumanization and the defamation of uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. We see that happening as well. And the kind of words that are used to describe his persona, the clown, the comedian, the artist, yeah, is never taken seriously, the puppet of the West. Uh, so we see obviously an increase in that. Uh, what we also see is an increase, increase and a blatant, so all masks are off now, uh, demonization of the West. Uh, in particular, what is interesting for Central Asia is there was a slight shift in narrative. So on the one hand, the demonization of Central Asian labor migrants is still present, but the language somewhat softened when they needed to be recruited to fight. And then they also began, started to be portrayed as an opportunity, you know, plus... Another interesting factor, so we were particularly looking at does Russia, does Russian state media cover people running away from mobilization? And first it was this awkward silence and just complete ignoring. Then they were, of course, uh, accused of being betrayers of the motherland. Uh, eventually, the rhetoric, however, changed into, again, this imperial language of Russia coming as an opportunity for Central Asia. So all those hundreds of thousands of people who run away from war, from mobilization and settling in, in Central Asia are, in fact, the manna from the sky uh, for Central Asia, you see. So it, it, it's something that, that has shifts here and there depending on the theme. But if we stick with the core, then this demonization of Ukraine, demonization of the West, is just entire uh, separate sections on websites and uh, news blocks have been dedicated to them. So in a huge increase in volume for, in that respect, in that particular theme. Looking at our questions, I see more coming, which is fantastic. So just going to read them live as they come. I see from uh, Akai. Akai Umrubekulu. Uh, is there a breakdown of what content is more influential, more watched, or more consumed in, in terms of Russian propaganda, uh, more serious points uh, like the need of security, NATO expansion, double standards versus fantasy, avert line, uh, biolapse, <laughs> Zelensky cocaine addiction, genocide of Russians in Central Asia uh, in the 90s, outright fake videos, images. The question is for everyone. Maybe it came up during your research. Um, whoever would like to take. Well, maybe I can give a, a general comment since I think that this is one of the challenges that we have in terms of methods. Um, so for example, the project that I just mentioned, what they do is they study the actual like the availability of these narratives. So they study the media products that are available. Uh, but the thing that is much more difficult for us to actually understand is how influential they are. So what we see oftentimes in, in commentary is that it is assumed that it is influential. And this is not necessarily the case, of course. It might also be that audiences actually uh, feel resistance uh, or that they disagree. Uh, so I think we should always keep a very open mind and be, uh, be open to that. 
At the same time, of course, when audiences have limited alternative sources, it becomes more difficult for them uh, because there is less alternative explanation. Uh, so I think that these three things are just general remarks uh, to keep in mind whenever we think about this. So that it is both those two. Uh, so do we actually uh, accept uh, or expect them to be always influential? So I think uh, communication science has debunked this largely. It's not that you, you show sh something to a person and then it changes their mind. It's actually very difficult to do. Uh, but when they are able to indeed tap into uh, long-standing uh, feelings, uh, pre preconceived notions, uh, already existing biases and so on, then of course it can be more influential uh, depending also on whether or not people are able to uh, to compare this information with other information or not. Uh, what, they're, what the society around them is saying, whether they feel that this resonates within their community. Uh, so I think we should still really take it seriously that we still speak about individuals uh, and at the same time also they are part of communities. So it's really about the social sense making and these media products uh, play a role in that process. Thank you, Marianne. Galina, would you be comfortable talking about the uh, potential influence and resistance to these kinds of narratives coming to audiences uh, in Ukraine? I'm afraid that my place around me became very noisy. Uh, if you are comfy, I can answer somehow. Uh, we are privileged well, to have you in any condition. Please, Galina, of course. Uh, well, uh, I already like uh, shifted my focus to the very last uh, question about um, government initiatives. Uh, I also uh, recalled it from our experience in Ukraine. Uh, we also ha had um, quite large Rus Russian-speaking population and Russian language media, and our government uh, after 2014. Uh, introduced uh, quotas on Ukrainian language in media, so government obliged the Ukrainian media to have at least 75% of all their products uh, in Ukrainian language. And uh, now uh, the, the, this demand is even stronger, and it was planned before, before the full-scale invasion. It is not connected to the full-scale invasion. We, of course, had debates. We, of course, had uh, some uh, political resistance because we also had used to have uh, pro-Russian political parties in our parliament, but uh, yes, we uh, managed uh, to, uh, to come to this uh, more or less uh, majority understanding uh, in our society among experts and government that we need uh, to support Ukrainian language. And also we have, uh, for example, government supported project on media literacy. Uh, they uh, do it uh, like uh, yeah uh, annually for, for for a couple of years maybe four years or three uh, and the government uh, cooperates quite uh, quite closely with civil society in uh, terms of uh, media literacy development and one more uh, interesting uh, detail uh, we conduct uh, our organization conducts um, media literacy index it's an opinion poll on annual basis and uh, during full-scale invasion uh, the level of media literacy of our citizens increased uh, significantly and uh, it means that people started to understand that the access to quality information is uh, vital for for them for uh, how can how they can survive in some um, cases uh, so we uh, i see a big opportunity in ukraine now to continue promoting media literacy because people minds are open to this concept and um, it's a good uh, sign uh, for uh, our society thank you helena also catch up this Go question ahead, please yeah, and I would maybe catch up from the very end of this question where uh, Aziz has mentioned about uh, Kazakhstan. Oh, sorry, the question is lost. Uh, Russian-speaking population consuming predominantly Russian-speaking media. I think Rashid has a very big article on that, right? On Russian-speaking, like when German uh, ethnic minorities who have migrated to Germany, they still consume, they keep consuming. If you keep talking to many of those people, they would still use Russian language and they're very exposed to Russian uh, media, and they are maybe very supportive of Russia during this war. And I think in the Netherlands, there are many uh, people who left Russia back then in the 90s and who still have that. And in Kazakhstan, it might seem that I link many things to language, but in fact, it is because 
in Kazakhstan, unfortunately, Kazakh language have not become over the last 32 years, have not become the language of all ethnic groups of ethnic minorities. Unfortunately, Russia, uh, Russian language is dominant uh, among ethnic minorities, so among non-ethnic Kazakh population, uh, which is very important to mention. And this is also one of the reasons. Uh, for sure, we see government attempts of, I don't think it is directly framed as tackling Russian propaganda, because I don't think it is something feasible for government uh, to be uh, to like presented this way because of all the economic ties and everything. And for sure, anyone understands that there might be some uh, politics of uh, like playing safe, of trying to play safe, considering what might happen. And of course, considering what Russian um, officials, government officials talk about, not only Kazakhstan, but other states, like questioning their territorial integrity, all those calls that Kazakhstan is being next and et cetera. But I would say that it has been long-term strategy in Kazakhstan that government uh, has been releasing movies on historic, uh, on different historical periods. Back then, I think it used to be very old ancient history. Now, they, for example, in Kazakhstan, released TV series uh, on one of the Kazakh intellectuals of 20th century who fought, um, actually, back then, Bolsheviks and all this period, the, the TV series called Oyan Kazakh, for example, those are, I think, state-funded uh, TV series. and. They try to do it this way, not directly by fighting Russian propaganda, but I think that it seems they played a different side of uh, increasing the sentiments of national awakening. And I don't use the word national in the way Russian media uses this to demonize what should happen, right? Because nationalists, the way Russia has been used it, is a very wrong term. And yeah, what we see is that states attempt to focus on local nation building on like state building has been continuing but i don't think that they directly cope with russian propaganda at least i personally did not observe this there might be something i've missed here but um, this is how i would uh how i would understand that thank you camilla i would like to add a couple of sentences as well and maybe i will combine the questions of akai and aziz here aziz john great to see you and just to repeat them for people watching us in a live stream without an access to our chat here so on the one hand uh, the reaction by audiences to some of these uh, well, ridiculous and bizarre content let's say and on the other hand uh, what measures is the government taking against this? So in my own research that has been ongoing now since 2016, on 15 even, looking at audience perceptions of Russian uh, narratives in Europe and in Central Asia, uh, you know, these kinds of fantasy, conspiracy, it, it has been also present on particular channels. Uh, there are some specific, uh, you know, audiences that long that but now we see that penetrating some of the more main, mainstream outlets as well for instance a concrete example uh sputnik kg service uh ran this several uh articles inviting local experts uh, commenting on the idea that ukraine is developing a biological bomb that is going to use on kyrgyzstan so if that was something for ntv in the past that is now also present on Sputnik KG. And here, of course, we can only hope for uh, critical thinking and resilience to terrible information on the side of audiences. However, tying this to the second question by Aziz John, why, should, why isn't the government reacting? With all the legislation that has been uh, you know, adopted on countering fake news, it has not a single time been applied to Russian media. It has been applied on critical voices of journalists who are performing investigative work, who are then stripped of their citizenship and deported to Russia, but it has not once been applied to Russian media. Do we have anything else to comment on this one by Marielle? Um, well, maybe if you if you allow me to, because uh, in, in one of the questions, uh, it was also mentioned about the position of Russian speakers in Germany, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so to perhaps also draw attention to what the situation is within the EU, uh, because, of course, the EU has taken quite unprecedented steps uh, in terms of limiting Russian state media. So initially putting a ban on uh, those that broadcast in European languages, so RT Sputnik, but then also expanding that to basically all Russian state media. Uh, and this also affects online. So for example, on YouTube, you would not be able to actually access all of those channels. And some of these limitations have also been actually implemented globally, which of course is, uh, is quite interesting in itself. 
Um, at the same time, this is, of course, not 100%. Uh, so, for example, you can still go to the website of Pierre Canal, and that's uh, pure, uh, nicely uh, available. Uh, there are multiple of these websites where you can just uh, consume Russian state media. Um, but in principle, this, of course, is also even within the EU a very fundamental challenge. Uh, since you want to limit the reach of this information, at the same time, if you put in place 100% bans or you try to enforce a 100% ban, uh, that actually is a very, uh, very, very forceful measure uh, that can also be taken uh, to signal censorship by these communities who feel that they are disenfranchised as a result. Uh, but at the same time, also, it's, very, it's a very tense relationship with the standards of media pluralism and media freedom that the EU seeks to uphold. Uh, so if we look back a few years ago, when in the Baltic states, of course, the Baltics were also very concerned about the uh, Russian state media being influential among their Russian speaking population. So we've seen uh, several temporary bans of Russian broadcasters. Uh, at that time, even though this was done through parliament and these were temporary restrictions, the EU was very, very critical of this. So the, the Baltic states were actually uh, told off that this is not permissible. Of course, now we are in the uh, reverse situation uh, where these bans are enforced Europe-wide, and it's also not really clear to what extent is seen as an open-ended thing or not. Uh, so I think that we really are at the stage where even for the EU, we have to have serious discussions about what this boundary is and what this kind of ban then actually has to look like. Uh, so are you aiming towards limiting the reach, so limiting virality and all of that, uh, or do you really want to take out all of these narratives, which, of course, is impossible to do? And it's important, this discussion, because we've seen several EU member states uh, that this anti-fake uh, policies are being used indeed to censor media. So they are used to, to, uh, to actually punish independent journalists. Um, so I think that this discussion is something that we should take on. Uh, and keep on the agenda. So what is really the boundary between, on the one hand, having effective measures in place that help limit the spread of disinformation, while at the same time making sure that those same measures and those same policies cannot be misused to, uh, to punish and limit media freedom. Uh, so this is a, perhaps a little bit of a sidetrack going to the EU, but I think that it's important to keep these discussions open since in many ways they are quite similar. Uh, so these discussions about how does the spread of information actually work, but also what can, what is the boundaries and uh, how can we make sure that we actually reach the end goal, which should be uh, protecting media, media pluralism as much as possible and making sure that citizens have access to independent information. Absolutely. <laughs> From a personal experience, you know, when I moved to the Netherlands, uh, the algorithms on Facebook gave me some suggestions to join these groups for Russophones. Right? So platforms play a major role here as well. And of course, uh, I joined them as a, as a researcher. <laughs> it, it was just, uh, for me, an interesting artifact. But what you quickly notice is that groups that are designed for practical purposes, yeah, because it's convenient. You can ask some questions, say, hey, how do I invite my mother you know, to the EU, right? Or uh, how do I pay taxes, whatever. But along with that, with those practical discussions, quickly there was a storm of politicized content. And of course, that also increased amid the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, where you know it, it just became such a such a space that uh, demonizes again the very European values and everything that, that is around people here. Uh, but at the same time, if you join for practical reasons and you have a community of 50, 70,000 people, it's so difficult to even leave that group because you will lose that connection. But the price tag, of course, is huge. And uh, these the admins of these online environments, they become like mini queens and kings of these kingdoms where they get to weed out the you know participants and monitor and edit the discussion. Uh, so if, if, if there is work to be done, then of course it needs to be done in these communities as well. We, so not only the algorithms, but there is often a human side behind it, because somebody running a group for Russophones in Amsterdam can be actually sitting on the outskirts of St. Petersburg yeah, and, and uh, conducting influence operations. There is a question about, okay, you mentioned that people are pushing for local languages. 
uh, and they are, as a result are portrayed as nationalists by Russian media. Does the Russian language media target pan-Turkic or Muslim sentiments? And is, if so, is it seen negatively or positively? Maybe I can tackle, tackle this one uh, real quick. There is no kind of explicit uh, take on this yeah, because you have to play it really carefully if you are Russian state media. <laughs> what you do though is that you use that Russophobia kind of concept. Yeah, so any attempts to rename the street, take down a, you know, a statue or any way to de-Sovietize, that is taken in a very sore manner, to put it uh, softly. And you know, the reaction is that you are Russophobes, you are nationalists, of course, and that you, know, you need to uh, not be like that because then you, your chances of becoming the next after Ukraine increase. So there is a threat in that domain. Of course, we also need to differentiate among who the message is targeting. If it's for domestic audiences in Russia, uh, and depending on the platform, of course, like every canal would, does not allow or itself that blatant of statements, but some of the local channels and newspapers do, uh, they can be quite anti-Islamic, uh, anti-Muslim, anti-migrant. But what you need to understand is that there is a lot of coexistences and paradoxes in Russian media. The same platform that was bashing on Muslims and immigrants yesterday, tomorrow can write a lovely paper on uh, colonial struggles of migrants and Muslims in Europe. The idea here is not to deliver a message, it's, it's just to uh, inflate the information flow and to make people lose faith in any information because then you are confused, you are lost. Just yesterday, I was at a presentation by Central Asia Barometer. They were measuring the uh, attitudes of Central Asian audiences towards war, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And they measured in the beginning, in the middle, and now re more recently, I guess, well, since the time has gone. Uh, and people are just becoming more and more confused. People just don't know what to believe anymore. And that is one of the major, uh, actually, tactics of Russian disinformation to make sure that people lose faith in all information altogether. Do we have any more inputs from the audience? We are approaching the end of our panel. I do have one input that was sent to me as a direct message and it resembles more of a um, essay. So it, it was written by uh, Ermek Said Batalov. Ermek, I, you, you put so yeah, who basically wrote quite a bit on um, the strategies for influence operations, how the information penetrates into human brain actually, who is the most exposed, susceptible to propaganda, how to fight propaganda. There is a lot of information here, three pages, almost a thousand words. Uh, I urge you to turn it into some kind of write-up, reach out to editors at, uh, well, why not Kabar Asia, IWPR, and see if you can turn it into some kind of a, a product that can be shared widely. So, uh, you know, I will, I, I'm afraid I will not do it justice just by reading it here, uh, you know, by taking out extracts, but I urge you to publish and then we can uh, all read it and continue this conversation. Uh, Camila needs to go to another meeting. Camila, thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, hope to see you uh, at other events. Do we have any more final words from the audience before we close off? Uh, I also invite anyone who has resources to share. Let's do that in the chat before we part ways. For example, just in case you haven't seen this report yet, I'll put it in the chat for everyone. Uh, this is the report of... Uh, Kabar Asia of IWPR and EU Europe Central Asia Monitoring of Center for European Security Studies. The report called, um, I still trust the Russian media more. The narratives and perceptions of Russian propaganda in Kyrgyzstan available in English, Kyrgyz and Russian. We also have a shorter policy brief. Is Halina still with us or is she also gone? Would be nice to uh, get some information on her organization as well. Just a reminder, it's called Detector Media. Please look it up, stay in touch. Yeah, because uh, it's really important to work on this topic together with Ukrainians. For instance, what we um, 
to really struggle with is to come up with, okay, but how do we tackle this? Uh, how do we bring in the Ukrainian voice? How can that be done, uh, especially amid the current, you know, the, the Ukraine is in a state of war, of course, so you cannot ask Ukraine to, to take much action in informing audiences in Central Asia, for instance, at the end of the day, uh, you know, they have uh, other priorities, but we need to collaborate, of course. Detector Media, uh, Olga, thank you for sharing the link. I don't see any other intervention. So I would just like to thank once again, the organizers, Olga Zavallova, thank you so much for all the logistics behind this event. Uh, Abahon Sultanazaro, thank you. Thank you to IWR team, IWPR team more broadly. Always a pleasure to work with you. I thank all of our speakers, Galina, Camila, Mariel, wonderful connecting with you here. Thank you for your inputs. I thank all of our participants online and those who watched us as a live stream. Again, this is just an initiation of the conversation, a beginning. Let's stay in touch. Let's formulate circles and workshop, conduct workshops and take this further. The action is urgent and it needs to be performed by a variety of stakeholders as we understand. We need uh, state representatives, we need platforms, we need the researchers here, we need civil society, of course, we need educate educators to work with audiences on media literacy. Everyone is needed, everyone's work is important and can contribute to a positive change. Final words. Thank you very much, all. Stay safe. That's good. Thank you, Abahon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank